City Council meeting to order. If you'd please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, present this evening are myself, Mayor Marl, Council Members Burgoyne, Gearbaugh, Peters, Rhodes, Roth, and Tahar. Staff present this evening, we have City Manager Campbell, Interim Clerk uh, Rutledge, um, Public Works Director Fordyce, City Treasurer Bennett, Parks and Rec Director Scruggs, Assessor Skull, Attorney Smith, Technology Support Coordinator Shonk, and Police Chief Rennick. Um, for the rest of you present, if you'd be so kind to sign up in the back, uh, we would appreciate that. It is my duty first to, to make a few announcements uh, this evening, the first of which is um, for my colleagues and those of you in the audience this evening. We are um, uh, running live this evening, so just as an FYI, I wanted to make you aware of that. I also wanted to make you aware that uh, this weekend was um, one of our police officers, uh, Denny Grushaw's last day of service with the City of Saline. Had a very nice retirement party today, and uh, we wish him and his family all the best in their future endeavors. Uh, and then finally, it's my duty to announce that uh, a longtime uh, community leader and resident uh, passed away last week, uh, Alberta Rogers, who was um, a school board member, the first executive director of uh, the Senior Center, first president of the Historic Society. Her husband served on this body for a number of years as, as Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, more personally, she had been uh, my family's neighbor since the fall of 1951. Um, and I had the honor of speaking at her funeral. Um, and uh, one of the things that I said, and as a person of faith, I'm very cognizant of this, uh, even though many of us will, will miss her greatly, uh, we'll see her again. So um, in acknowledging all that, if you would please uh, join me in a moment of silence, remembering Ms. Rogers, uh, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Um, can I have a, a motion to approve the agenda as submitted unless there are amendments? So move as submitted. Move by Rhodes to approve as submitted. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Peters. Discussion? Hearing none. Oh, Mr. Burgoyne. Yeah, I just wanted to add as a discussion item um, the former service center property, that strip of land um, near the railroad. Okay. I want to bring that back. I want to make sure that's included in the transaction. Okay. So that will be added after the, um, an update from our legal counsel on the um, fireworks ordinance. Okay. Mr. Rhodes, do you mind uh, modifying your motion to approve as amended then? Move to approve as amended. Okay. Mr. Peters, you're comfortable seconding that? Sure. Okay. Um, hearing no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it, and the motion carries. We have no absences this evening, so we'll dispense with that. Um, we move on to one of our two presentations this evening, the first of which is a Celine Main Street update. Um, and we have both our Main Street director, Bob Rosenberger, and our Main Street chair, Cindy Zup Zupko, here this evening. So um, please, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, Celine Main Street. I have two reasons for being here this evening. The first is to uh, present a quarterly update on everything that's going on in Celine Main Street. And the second is to, uh, uh, with a signed proposal, uh, which I believe you have a copy of as well. Um, so quarterly report first, if that's okay with you. Uh, talk about what's happening at Celine Main Street. Um, lots of Lots is happening at Celine Main Street, as always. It's a great and fun organization. Um, I apologize for getting this to you late, in fact, just before the, the meeting. Um, I know sometimes you like to look things over beforehand, but it's been a kind of crazy and busy week with the Mastodon Mayhem Challenge, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, anyway, let's start with the design team. Uh, the design team continues to work uh, on uh, their master plan, their master work plan. Um, and the first phase of that is the alley beautification project. Uh, B. Blumen, I'm going to run through these quickly, ask me questions if you have any. Uh, the B. Blumen project is uh, well underway. The flowers are in place. They look beautiful. Uh, the, uh, the plaques, except for the new ones, are in place as well. And uh, thanks to Councilman Rhodes and to the Youth Council for participating in getting the plaques in place. We really appreciate that. Uh, public improvements uh, work plan includes trash receptacles being painted this summer. Um, the developing of gathering spaces work plan is all about the alleyway, and we are in the process of working on that. Uh, 
we have um, an arch that we're planning to uh, put on that matches or complements is a better word for uh, Murphy's Crossing Arch across the street. Uh, the design team, the board members, and the council have approved the plans, and the low bidder was Valley City Sign, a Michigan company, and they will, they've been in touch with the, pit, the city about permits, and they're going to begin construction drawing and construction soon, we hope. Uh, the Building Basics Workshop, a Building Basics Workshop, was conducted on April 29th at Bongiamo's. It was uh, led by a specialist from Michigan Main Street. 14 people attended. Um, and we, we received two applications for design assistance, and that's exciting news, so we're hopeful that uh, we'll get some design work done and some enrichment of our downtown area. And the agriculture, arch, let me try that again, the architectural treasure hunt uh, is being tweaked and finalized. Councilman Roth has been uh, very nice and put together many pictures that we will be using. Um, the BES, or Business and Economic Structuring Team, uh, we did have one business that expanded in the time that we, uh, in this last quarter, and that's Workout One at 118 East Michigan. Uh, they have a space that they've, they've really increased by tenfold. It's, it's amazing, and you can see a picture uh, attached there. Um, the Opportunity Tour is a tour that we continue to plan and, and see if we can put together. Uh, it's an opportunity to look at the downtown spaces. We do have two spaces that will be opening new businesses soon. Uh, the former Yoga Centric Studio will be a tanning salon. And the um, CC Sweet House, I understand, is going to be a sandwich shop and deli. So that's exciting news. And uh, a market study is, uh, you, you know, of course, uh, because we've talked about it before, that we have a market study uh, that's going to be part of, um, uh, well, a market study of downtown Celine. It's, uh, we applied in October of 2012 and were awarded this study. Um, it's uh, going to be conducted by a, um, a, a gentleman who's, who works with the National Main Street Program. Uh, the first steps included a uh, pre-survey of our downtown businesses, uh, an intercept or man on the street uh, survey, a Celine area market profile, and meetings with that consultant. 50% um, of the businesses have responded to the surveys that we handed out, and uh, hopefully we're, we're still working to hopefully get some more. Uh, we want, we'd love to have 100%, but we'll, we'll work on getting as many as we can. Uh, the next step is an important step. It's a, uh, it takes place this Wednesday evening from 6 to 7.30 p.m. at Stone Arch. It's a public meeting. The public is invited. Uh, we'd love to have as many stakeholders or people who are interested in what the future of downtown Celine can be to attend the meeting. Um, we'll have um, LaCroix. What's that stuff called? It's a... Uh, of sparkling water and cookies, so come on down. But what, more importantly, we'll have some great conversation and a, a, a workshop, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, at the end of your packet, you should see a flyer that, uh, that talks about its, uh, this meeting. It's called Grow Downtown. And again, it's Wednesday, July 17th, 6 to 7.30 at Stone Arch. Um, on to the promotions team. Boy, the promotions team has really been busy. We just finished the mu Music Under the Arch program. Uh, we had 240 volunteer hours. As you know, M MUTA, or Music Under the Arch, is, uh, runs through uh, from January through May. Uh, we had 100 plus people per event. Uh, we raised $3,600 round figures, which is very exciting stuff. It's the first year that the event has actually made a profit, so we're very excited about that. Uh, the summer music series, uh, if you've been, and I've seen many of you there, has been a great event this year. We've been filling South Ann Arbor Street with uh, happy people and, and kids drawing on the, on the street and, and great music. And uh, kudos to our, uh, our team who puts this together, especially the very first week when the band that we were supposed to have canceled the afternoon of the event. And we still pulled off a great event with a substitute band, and uh, so kudos to all those people. Uh, the Wicked Kickin' Hoedown continues. It's a uh, country hoedown with line dancing and food and music and a mechanical bull and dueling banjos and a live action and whew, it's going to be fun. It's really going to be a lot of fun. That will take place in September, uh, I mean October, on Saturday the 26th at the new facility with Workout One, or that Workout One has. The Mastodon Mayhem Memorial Challenge. Thank you so much to Mr. Peters, uh, Councilman Peters, and, and to the uh, um, 
uh, Celtic Festival for allowing us to be a part of that. We ran it on Saturday morning before the uh, event took place, and um, it was a, a huge success for a first-time event. We had 133 participants. We had a lot of spectators. We had a hard-working volunteer team that put together a tremendous obstacle course, and the people came across muddy and wet and laughing and having a good time and talking about how they couldn't wait till next year so they can do this again. So we look forward to a successful event for many years to come. Um, a lot of fun, really. Ladies' Night Out, the next one is October. Uh, in October, Teresa Leichert of Oxygen Plus and Ann Brandon from The Bling Thing are our new co-chairs. and. Um, they are tying it into October's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So think pink and uh, come on down and shop in October. Um, the uh, Celine Main Street is committing $1,000 toward uh, Promote Celine, the Promote Celine effort, which I think is a great effort that we're really looking forward to seeing come to fruition because it's gonna give us the tools we need to make Celine or to, to promote Celine. Uh, Oktoberfest continues to be planned. Uh, the entertainment lineup this year includes 50 Amp Fuse, uh, the Frankenmuta Franzen, and um, another favorite, the Polka Riot. There you go. Uh, pl we're planning more games and a larger Kinder Plots area. And the banner over the street uh, work plan is taking a little longer than usual, or not usual, but expected, I should say. And we are in the, but, uh, but we're working, we're, we're, we're moving forward, and we're researching uh, costs to replace the hardware at this time. Uh, on the second page, you'll see um, a picture of, um, or two pictures. One is the Celine Fiddlers at um, um, Summer Music Fest. And the second picture, we had a lot of people at Mastodon who, grew, who dressed up. We encouraged contests. We had some guys running in kilts and some team that wore identical shirts. And this is the Minions and Crew from, I don't know, what's the name of that animated film? I, Despicable Me. Yeah. Despicable Me. Yeah, there you go. Despicable me. Thank you. And then on to organization. Uh, in the time that, um, in the last quarter, we've had 149 volunteer hours for the board, 240 for the org team, uh, 278 for the promotion team, design team was over 115, the best team over 103 for a total of 890 volunteer hours. We have great volunteers at Celine Main Street and throughout Celine, which is pretty exciting stuff. You can see that there were several um, uh, uh, fundraising activities, we raised uh, over $7,200 public funds, 1,230 private funds, and over 16,000 uh, including funds from events in, through sponsorships. Um, the training sessions, we had several training sessions that were attended by um, not only Celine Main Street people, but also by, um, um, by people within the community. Um, the Business Basics had nine business and property owners, and the volunteer training had 12, including several from other organizations, so that's exciting. Uh, we do have one board member who is, has turned in her resignation, but she's hanging on for a little while longer to help see some of the projects she's begun through fruition, and that's um, Dorothea Mego Dowling. Um, uh, let's see, the uh, resource team visit, many of you participated in that. We appreciate your help with that. Thank you so much to City Hall for, and, and, and uh, Mr. Campbell for allowing us to uh, invade your space. That was a great visit. Uh, Great news came out of that, that they love Celine. They, 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 they uh, complimented the people. They said everybody was friendly. The, the downtown was clean and neat and well kept. Um, everything was wonderful. Now, usually they do a resource team visit after a community has been a, a Main Street community for two years. We've only been a community for one year, so we were, I think that's a, a very positive thing that they came in, and they gave us many great compliments. They certainly had some recommendations, but they're pleased with our efforts and our results so far, and uh, this is kind of fun. They told us that our program is quickly becoming a model for programs for new Main Street communities throughout the nation. So that's a, a compliment to all of us who've worked so hard on, on Celine Main Street um, throughout the community. Um, the uh, volunteer work plan, we had a, a specialist from um, Michigan Main Street come and talk with uh, us about um, <clears throat> uh, volunteers. And we had, uh, it was open to the public and we had a dozen people attending, including five leaders from uh, volunteer driven organizations. The Celine School Foundation, St. Andrews, Evangelical Homes, and the Celine Chamber were there. So that was exciting thing, exciting thing for us 
to happen for us as well. And uh, we continue to raise funds. Uh, our corporate sponsor program now includes Forcia, Jets Pizza, Bank of Ann Arbor, La Fontaine, Bemis Farms, Flat Out Breads, Leap Hair, Toyota, Toyota, Key Bank, Sprint, McNaughton and Gun, Resale Boutique, and it totals $14,700. So lots of things happening at Celine Main Street. And then the uh, last thing I would like to talk with you about is a proposal to uh, City Council. Um, and if I can find it, we'll talk about it. It's um, to place our, our signs, our, our, the signs that recognize us as a um, Main Street community. When you're a select community um, or a, um, a master level community, you get a sign, you get signs to designate your community. Our signs look like this. We have two, one for each end of town. And uh, um, anyway, uh, we, uh, the first step we, we took to, uh, to figure out what to do with these um, was to talk to city, uh, at the city staff meeting. And it was recommended there that we might replace the uh, cool neighborhood signs since the program is defunct now. And um, while we are still a cool neighborhood, uh, not sure we need the signs. So uh, they, those signs uh, exist just east of Harris on Michigan Avenue and just west of um, Lewis, which is un convenient for us because it marks those, those are the boundaries, the east and west boundaries of our, our district. So um, we request approval from uh, city council to hang the signs there. Um, any questions? And of course, Bob, that will be a subsequent action item under new business this evening to okay. officially do that. I'm sorry, I, no, that's did I right. jump the gun? No, no, you didn't, you didn't. Okay. You prefaced by, uh, <laughs> by alluding to something that will be coming up later on on the agenda. So that was good. Do, you, does any, uh, um, do any of my colleagues have uh, questions or comments for Mr. Rosenberger? Mr. Burgoyne. Um, under the um, economic su success team, you have downtown housing as an item. Um, what can we do to encourage downtown housing or, you know, as, as you come back here in the future, if there's anything you can you can uh, pull us into to, to try to because I, I do think that when people live downtown it makes the downtown more vibrant so the, and and I think that's a good goal I don't see anything any activity there but it would be nice in the future to have some activity there. Agreed, and, and it is a discussion point, and it will probably be a discussion point on our Wednesday, at our Wednesday evening uh, public forum, public workshop. Um, it's, uh, we find that this, the research tells us that 20-somethings are looking for um, places in communities, downtown residences, so it's something that, that we're aware of. Um, it's on the sheet because that's part of the reporting. Sure. <laughs> Cindy's here. Um, it's part of the reporting. It's part of the reporting to um, to Michigan Main Street. Um, one of the things that we also wanted to let you know is that our strategic planning is going to be next. Is that Wednesday too, the twenty fourth? No. There's been you know like every day of the week. Yeah. Um, but on the twenty fourth, we take our results from the resource team visit, and now the board's going to start really brainstorming and do their strategic planning for two thousand fourteen. And then those goals will be set, and then each of the work, each of the um, four teams will take a look at what those goals are, and things like that will be brought up and talked about. But definitely agree with you. That is a big part of revitalizing downtown. Okay. Well, thank you both. We greatly appreciate you being here. And I'll just reiterate one more time, because this, uh, this flyer was provided to each one of you, and I've seen a number of these uh, around uh, the community. Please make an effort, if your schedule permits, to attend um, this, uh, this event this Wednesday from 6 to 7.30 p.m. in downtown Saline at Stone Arch. Um, as the flyer says, it's our future, so don't miss it. So okay. hope and to see everyone there. Council members are invited to our strategic planning, so we will get an email Terrific. out to Todd. Wonderful. So they, um, Thank you. Thank you both. Appreciate it. Okay. okay. There's nothing further um, relating to our Main Street update. I'm going to ask our technology director, Mr. Schock, to come forward to talk about um, citizen engagement portal, which is something we've discussed in the past. It's something that uh, Council Member Rhodes has been um, um, very passionate about. And so we've done a little bit of, of research and background, and Chris is here to, to report back on that. Thank you for being here, Chris. Oh, thank you. 
give the screen a second to come down and then we'll get into it here. Okay, so what I'd like to unveil today is two what I feel is really exciting ways we can interact with our residents on a new level. Um, the first product I'm going to show is by Granicus. Um, it is uh, an online feedback portal. So uh, just to give a little feedback on Granicus, they are the biggest player in the space. Um, they only work with government entities from our size city to all the way up to the federal level. So that's, that's all they do is just government and it's all different facets. Chris? So, sorry to interrupt, because you're on a roll and you're going to do a great okay. job. No, but I just wanted just to give a little more detail. Oh, okay. Um, that as, as the mayor mentioned, Mr. Rhodes had pushed us out there, and and so staff, city council directed staff to look at some of the different social medias uh, uh, capabilities out there, whether it be, and I certainly don't, I'm not going to steal very much of Chris's thunder because uh, he's done a great job. Uh, but from the apps on the phones to you know reporting a pothole to um, to asking surveying our residents um, what they think about uh, a project or an idea or something of that nature. So what we did, there's a as we all might imagine, there's a ton of these uh, companies out there that provide these types of services. And so uh, with staff and and mainly Chris, we uh, asked him he he. Uh, took a number of these different uh, uh, companies and met with them and went through what they have to offer. And, and this is, is staff's uh, recommendation as far as where we think would be the, uh, the, 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 plus, the, the, the best way to go in this direction if that's what council wants us to do. So um, unless there's any questions, I just want to give a little preface for the folks at home mm -hmm. as well as out in the audience too so we know a little context. So all right. thank you, Chris. Okay. Yep, so we'll jump back in. So, um, like I was saying, Granicus is the biggest uh, player in the space, and I feel they have the really the best offering for what we're looking to achieve here. So, um, how Granicus works is they have a lot of different facets of what we're looking to do. So, um, all these kind of puzzle pieces here rely on the Granicus open platform. Um, the piece I'm specifically looking at right now is the citizen partic participation suite, but down the road we could always add them later if we, if we want to get more into it. Um, the one that also kind of excites me is the, the government transparency suite. Um, is really for online um, records management, which is kind of a, a kind of a nice feature, and it would they would integrate together. So, um, but down the road, that that's something we could look at. But for right now, I'm going to focus on the uh, citizen partici participation suite. So, um, how it works is it uh, it will be totally online through an app or through a website. So, um, we'll have a link on our city website directing uh, residents to that place. Um, it's completely automated. People can fill it out. We will be alerted to that proposal or whatever they're looking to do and uh, makes it really easy. So there's very limited staff time to, to kind of monitor it. It's, it's really kind of self-sufficient. So um, how it works is there's, there's three different levels to it. Um, the open kind of crowdsourcing, if you will, um, people can pro post ideas. So, hey, I think we should do this in the community. They can post it, we'll be alerted to it, and then also other residents can be uh, interact with that idea. So, hey, I think that's a great idea. We should do it as well, and we can see that in real time. Hey, there's a lot of traction on this. We should look at it and kind of focus on it. Um, the other one, the focus projects, are things we can put out there. So, from city staff perspective, from a council perspective, that's things we can blast out. Uh, I was kind of curious. I know Mr. Hart put out a thing on Facebook about the AATA project. Would be a great example of that. Hey, what should we do with this? What you know is is this something that's good? We could throw that out there, you know, and see what how citizens feel about it. So. Um, kind of a great example. And then the other uh, piece is uh, on the agenda. So for city council, for any other boards and commissions, we can put those, we submit them to Granicus, then we can uh, have each agenda item for feedback. So they can, you know, we can go the whole agenda. How do you feel about, you know, specific pieces or how we want to do it? We can break it all out and, and kind of make it granular. So. And as well, the, this other piece is uh, there's an iPad app for it as well. So if people in the audience, if council members wanted to have the, the iPad app, you could see in real time. Um, it's, it's primarily for bigger cities, but at the same time, it, it would work on our level as well. So we can see comments. You can see, you know, residents in favor of it or against an item kind of in real time and for each item. So um, and then the just to kind of jump ahead of the cost of it, uh, there is an annual fee. There's no setup fee. Um, but there's an annual f cost of about $7,000 for, for this piece. So um, I know I'm kind of moving quickly on it. If there's any questions, um, you can feel that, and then I'll move on to the next um, portion of it. So. Mr. Gearbaugh? 
Sure. How is moderation handled? Were you monitors um, and everything? Yeah, else? And it, it's it's up to our discretion. So if we want to allow, you know, no profanity to um, have every commenter's idea approved, you can go to that kind of level so that nothing's automated necessarily. Um, I think there's a benefit though to have because the other option too, you you can have anonymous submissions or you can require username and logins for for everybody. So um, I think there's a benefit to having people have that kind of openness where they can submit an idea without us having to approve it, they can kind of run with it, if you will, depending on, on what it is. So. Is it mainly textual based or does it include, if somebody wants to load up, upload a picture or graphs or anything like that? They could do that as well, okay. absolutely. Yep. They can submit content to it. So. I think we can keep moving, Chris. Okay. Um, the next piece is C Click Fix. This will be, uh, it's actually kind of timely given the, the work session earlier, but the primary focus of this is a report management system. So uh, any open tickets, um, any open issues, um, this would be the place to go. Um, this is a, an actual mock-up of what the app will look like. It's on all major smartphones, so iPhones, Android, Blackberry, Windows Phone, it's on everything. So it's really powerful to be able to say any phone that you have with a data plan, you're in. You can use it. There's no restrictions. Um, it's absolutely free, and uh, it works really well. I've been using it for a little bit here. Um, so how it works is uh, residents, anyone who downloads it, uh, can start a new report. It automatically has a GPS location, so we'll know if they're in the city or not. If not, we can forward it on. Um, unfortunately, people in Ann Arbor are submitting reports, but the city of Ann Arbor isn't on it, so they wouldn't know about it officially, but as an example, we can make sure anyone in the city we can specifically deal with. So um, they can also attach an image. So whatever they're doing, they can take a picture of it. Hey, this, you know, there's graffiti here. This curb is broken. They can take a picture of it. So city staff knows exactly what they're, what they're referring to. Um, so also it's, it's completely customizable. So there's no pre categories. There's no baked in questions. We can set up as many questions categories as we want. Um, we can also tailor them to our ordinances. So if one thing applies and another doesn't in different communities, we will be able to change that. We can also set up secondary questions. So um, in this example, you know, there's graffiti on a wall. Is it first floor or higher floor? We could have, is it private property? Is it public property? Is it offensive? Is it not? You can code, completely customize it. So, and then also on the, the right, you can see the, the GPS on the map, um, on the app, it automatically submits it. They don't even have to, to change it, so. The other really nice feature about this, and it's kind of rare in this space, um, like Todd mentioned, uh, I've, I've done quite a few webinars, and most of them are pretty canned apps. So they say, oh, this is your city, they plug in your name, they plug in your logo, and you're done. You, you, you're kind of play in their field, if you will. Um, the one thing I really like about C Click Fix is that the app buttons are completely customizable. So at, at the heart of it, it's going to be a report system, but also we can add any buttons we want. So with Celtic on last week, oh, that's important, we can put it right up front. Whatever you know, we feel is, is necessary at the time. We can have Facebook right there. The, the Twitter integration is there in the mock-up. We can have almost like a, a central portal for the city. So it's kind of nice to have that customization. Um, and this is just the back end kind of showing how easy it is to. This isn't going to be something, you know, you have to be a tech guy to do. Uh, you know, at, at any city level, it's very straightforward on how to, you know, run it, how to do it. It's, it's not very, very complicated there. This also, so this is an example of what the website would look like. So we're going to have a page specifically for just C Click Fix. So we can direct people just to it. Here it is. They can submit tickets on there. They can follow their tickets. Um, they can see current open tickets. So they're not submitting the same thing over and over. Um, by default, everything submitted is public, um, which also is the benefit so you don't get the redundant tickets. Um, and also, everything is kept for a week on the website. So if something has been fixed, residents can see it up to a week and everything is kept on the back end. We can see it for tracking purposes indefinitely. So it's kind of a good way to, to keep everybody there. Um, it also integrates with Facebook, which I think is really important, especially um, with the social media presence that we have. Uh, it'll integrate completely. People can open tickets just like they could on the website. They can follow them, everything with their Facebook pages. So um, and this is an example of the city of Raleigh using it. So we'll have that integration as well. Um, just to show kind of the analytics of it, uh, you can track how many days it took to answer a response. You know, what's the typical grass cutting, you know, response time? How long does it take to, to just kind of tie that up? Um, you can see that all in the back end. There's really deep integration um, with, you know, any graphing. Um, we can also export the data. So if we want to put in Excel and do our own analytics, we can do that. We don't have to rely on theirs. We can kind of take the data and run with it. So it's kind of nice. 
They also have some really kind of neat mapping features. We can integrate uh, neighborhoods if we wanted. So historic districts, for instance, if you want to see, you know, are, are there a lot of speeders in historic districts, you could have that integration. You could also have the heat map. So where does a certain type of incident happen the most? You would have that capability. Um, you can kind of drill down and do some really deep kind of analysis. Um, and then also from, from a city perspective, uh, we could have the app installed on our smartphones and we can also deal with uh, things in the field. So uh, if there's a broken sidewalk, they repair it, they can take a picture of it, follow up with whoever submitted it. Yep, we took care of that, here's a picture of it. You know, any other concerns, contact you know, whoever. So um, it is very nice and you can do that from a mobile app or we, you know, if you have a, a laptop in the field, they can do that from there as well. So. And then also for, uh, for our DPW, potentially, uh, not everyone there has a smartphone. So what this would allow uh, whoever to do, they could print it out, have all the information in their hand when they go out. Where was it? What's the picture of it? Are there you know, field notes? Did this happen before? Um, any kind of backstory? You would have that all on the first time so you don't have to you know, make multiple trips. So really kind of nice. And then also, uh, we currently use Nixle for uh, push notifications based on location, so any alerts and things. Um, C Click Fix isn't quite there yet as far as, uh, as powerful as Nixle is. They don't have a texting component like Nixle does, but uh, they are aware of that deficiency and they said this is something they're actively pursuing. They want to be able to, to kind of get in that space and really take over it. So um, we have this feature now and he said they're going to grow that over time. So it's just another, another piece of kind of puzzle there. And then uh, kind of a couple quick questions. Um, the one thing I really like about this is there's no advertising as well. Some of the apps, um, that's how they do it. They have a really low sticker price, but then when you get into it, oh yeah, there's ads for whatever on there to kind of subsidize that cost. So um, they don't have any ads in this, which, which I really like. So um, there's a one-time setup fee of, of 2,000 there. And then there's unlimited users, which is also nice. And it's uh, an annual fee of, of $6,000. So that's where we're, we're looking at now. So any questions, comments? Questions for Mr. Shank? No? Okay. Oh, oh Mr. Harp, well, excuse me. I'm not sure this is a question for Mr. Shank, but so all of this information is coming in, who receives it? Uh, it or depends. who would receive it? Right, so uh, we can assign roles depending on what it is. So let's, let's say grass is high. We could assign that to a certain person as opposed to if a curb was broken. We can have it automate to another person. So we could have it go down to a specific employee. We could assign it to a department. It, it really depends on what, we're, what it, I guess, what the, the issue is. Okay. So. so it can be automated to shoot to the Yes, absolutely. Place. So it's okay. really automated. There's a very nice workflow. It's very automated. Okay. Thank you. Additional questions? Mr. Rhodes? I was just going to comment. I think Chris actually used the free portion of C Click Fix, right. <clears throat> which I set up a couple years ago, and you know, as, as a potential use within the community, it didn't get a lot of traction at that point. But somebody had to be a contact, and since it was unofficial, I made myself the contact. So he sent me a picture of some litter, <laughs> which I then forwarded on to our code enforcement officer, who then forwarded it to the owner of the property, and that just happened last week. Friday yeah. or something, I think, and if, you know, it all, all transpired within the case of a couple of hours, and there was a photograph with it, so everybody knew exactly what it was we were talking about and where it was. So, and I, as I said, that was the free version. I didn't have any idea what all the more upgraded thing could do, mm. but it's pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah, it works really well. Mr. Dearbaugh? I think the C-Clix fix would be a great um, process that we put in place that I think is going to track things because I think this is something that we've been wanting to see and then basically be able to monitor all the uh, aspects of it, especially from the data standpoint. Right. Um, I would like to see us, well, my comment, maybe we can talk about this later, but I think that's something, and thanks for your presentation, that I believe this is one of our uh, goals that we are looking at this year. So thank you for investigating this for us. You're welcome. Um, additional questions for, uh, for Mr. Shank. Mr. Roth. I want to thank Chris and all the others who assisted you with mm -hmm. this. And I'm just wondering what our next steps are going to be. Well, I'm just going to get to that in just a moment. <laughs> okay. Uh, just, I didn't Absolutely. specify a timeline either. So uh, I'd like to have this online. They, they say generally four to six weeks. So if we get to go ahead today, you know, be roughly that timeline. Thank you. I know that this is a, um, a lot to consume, uh, at least initially, but what we're looking for tonight, um, and of course um, Chris or Mr. Campbell can make additional statements, is some sort of consensus from uh, the legislative body as to what they would like to do, what, what services and products um, 
we think would be uh, most appropriate to utilize with the understanding that much of the cost um, to, to acquire these, these services and products would probably come out of that innovation fund which we created in this, uh, this fiscal year's budget. Um, and then if there is a consensus to move forward, some sort of action item and appropriate corresponding motion would probably come back to us at our first or second meeting in August. Okay. Mr. Burgoyne. What's the approximate cost? Uh, uh, depending on the, the portions, the uh, the Granicus portion was, I believe, $7,000 um, annual fee, and then the C-Click fix was uh, the $8,000 with the $2,000 upfront cost. Um, I budgeted $5,000, but the products at that price point really, I don't think, fit our needs. So um, the rest would come out of the innovation fund, potentially. Mr. Campbell, do you care to comment? No, no okay. I was going to make a clarification. Um, so again, I understand that it was a, a lot to digest and uh, Chris did a very good job uh, making the information accessible to those of us who are not uh, experts in this field. Um, but as uh, Mr. Gearbaugh and Mr. Rhodes just indicated, this is one of uh, um, our councils, uh, this is a council goal to, to improve uh, accessibility and, and the way in which we communicate effectively with our, our residents and our constituents. It's a, a goal of mine personally as mayor, so uh, I'm very much in favor of moving forward and bringing back an appropriate motion um, at one of our upcoming council uh, meetings. But I would like to hear from, from the, uh, the rest of my colleagues. If, I, if, I don't, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot, Mr. Roth, do you have an opinion on this? I think it's great. Okay. Mr. Gearbaugh? Yeah, I'm um, fine with the C-Click fix. I'm about the Granicus one for the participation thing. I'm not so sure how that's going to play out. Um, if we may be able to use some other freer based ones like Facebook or some of the other aspects, that might be a more cost effective way. Um, but I just need to know more and understand more about the Granicus one. So. Okay. Okay. Mr. Rhodes? And I obviously <clears throat> support moving forward with both of them. I, th I think um, you know, there will be commensurate man hour savings that will help offset the, the cost of uh, utilizing both these programs. Mr. Hart? Yes, I'm in favor of moving forward. Okay. Mr. Peters? Yeah, I think it's very clever. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Burgoyne? Yeah, I'd like to um, see how much they're used and what kind of response we get, but uh, try things out. Okay. Sure. So, uh, Mr. Schock, Mr. Campbell, it sounds like, at least per Mr. Gearbaugh's request, and I, I guess I would agree with this to a certain extent, if we could get a little bit more information on Granicus, sure. uh, and then when the action item comes back at either our first or second meeting in August, uh, to Mr. Burgoyne's comment, which is which is which um, has a lot of validity, I'd like to know how, how we would go about either monthly or quarterly receiving some sort of report monitoring the uses and effectiveness of sure. each of the, the tools. Okay. Mr. Campbell, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to, to see... Um, I, I think we have consensus, but I just, uh, is this something that we want to do the C-click fix and see how that goes? Do we want to push it off at the same time? I, I just want to make sure. Um, I I'd do it all and try it out. Okay, mm -hmm. all. Mr. Roth, I'm assuming based on your comments, you're in favor of both, correct? Definitely. Okay, Mr. Rhodes, yes. Yeah. Okay, Ms. Tahar, yes. yes. Mr. Peters, yes. yes. Okay. okay, Mr. Gearbaugh, I'd like to get a little bit more information on <laughs> Granicus. I think would be appropriate prior to uh, asking us to vote on an, a, a motion to expend public resources for something like this. Sure. Okay. okay. I feel like you have consensus now, direction. Yes, yep. Okay. Thank you. Any additional comments, questions, what Mr. Question? Gearbaugh? Is there a possibility of getting some information from some of the other communities that you showed in their effectiveness? It'd be interesting to see how they ramped sure. up yeah. Yeah, from yeah, exactly. inset, onset to when they've actually been using it for a year or so. Okay. So, cool. Yeah. Mr. Tahar? <clears throat> to follow up on that, if I could, um, also t in, in view of Mr. Burgoyne's comment, to find out how long it took for them to realize uh, that it was working effectively, because okay. I mean, I'm sure that there will be a period where people will have to get used to it, so we shouldn't right. try to evaluate it instantly. Okay. Um, right. So just how long it takes for it to become really effective would be useful, too. Very good. Okay. Chris, we appreciate your, your, your work Thank on this you. um, and your very thorough presentation. Mr. Campo, appreciate your assistance as well. Um, and we'll try and gather this information that, that you all have requested and bring this back as an action item either on the um, 5th or the 19th. Okay. Uh, we move on to citizen comments on agenda items. Under the Open Meetings Act, any citizen may come forward at this time and make comment or question on an item that appears on this agenda. Comments will be limited to three minutes per person. Anyone who would like to speak is requested, but not required, to state his or her name and address for the record. Are there any citizen comments? 
No, then we move on to the consent agenda. The, consent, the following consent agenda will normally be adopted without discussion. However, at the request of any citizen or council member, any item may be removed from the consent agenda for council discussion. Is there a motion to approve and adopt the items on the consent agenda as submitted? So moved. Moved by Mr. Gearbaugh. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Roth. Hearing no discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. <coughs> Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. Moving on to unfinished business, item 13-110, People's Park slash 207 Monroe Street. This will be a series of three motions, the first of which is a motion to acknowledge receipt of the July 10th, 2013 memo from City Manager Campbell and the July 11th, 2013 letter from Attorney Smith. Move there, to acknowledge receipt. Moved by Mr. Burgoyne to acknowledge receipt. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Tahar. I'm going to turn it over to City Manager Campbell and Legal Counsel Smith to, uh, to make comment if, if that is their wish. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Essentially, you may recall, um, this was on the, the last uh, city council meeting and a lot of great discussion and comments and questions. And so that's why we, as it's, it's reflected in my memo, we, we left the, the um, motions, the proposed motions as they were, just because there, was, there, there weren't any, while there were a lot of comments and questions and clarifications made, there, there wasn't uh, a, you know, one or two uh, uh, individual uh, directions given so we want to provide the information that was requested which one was um, the um, easement for the common um, um, drive through the, the current daycare um, which that is you see that in there that that, that is in fact uh, in place uh, and then also wanted a, a clearer or a better um, more complete picture map site map that uh, we provided uh, as well and so you can see that, and also in addition to that, we've added, um, see the, the picture with the, the red line through it, um, it shows where staff uh, would propose to um, run the, the 30 foot uh, setback, for lack of a better term, into the, the current uh, city property, uh, 207 Monroe Street. And um, um, you find the, the question of um, the amount of acreage, uh, about 3.61 uh, acres, and that includes those four parcels to the, to the east that are adjacent to the east, um, along with uh, taking out um, the uh, 0.35 acres where that, that is reflected in that uh, red line. Um, so, but still allowing one of the, one of the, the um, Objectives, I believe, for the council wanted was to maintain as much, if not all, the frontage along Monroe, uh, which which does that. Um, but so I think, I believe we provided the, the information um, that uh, council requested, and so we're just looking for direction. And Are there any questions for City Manager Campbell? No questions. Oh, Mr. Gearbox, excuse me. Um, just a question on the 30-yard, 30 uh, 30-foot wide access. Is that sufficient to then what basically put kind of like a S-curve drive that goes in if we ever wanted to to access behind the tennis courts and all that? Or uh, is the intent to put the drive on the other side of the um, tennis courts? Well, this would include this would include uh, as it shows on uh, on the, the large drawing, 11 by 17, the new um, parking on the south side. Of the daycare, so this would be that the, kind of the, the the pull in and drop off, turn around and come back out option. Is that 30 feet. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I my question was just to make sure that it was wide enough and we have enough backwards to make sure that we have another drive if we want to get on the other side of it. Because you never know if we're going to have construction or anything in that park making sure we've got both ways and sufficient access from both sides. Sure. Well, again, uh, um, if I understand correctly, you certainly would have the ability currently with, <coughs> depending on what we do on the, be the east end of that proposed parking lot, uh, any kind of barrier to, to be able to access down by the, the, the basketball court in between the basketball. I know there's a, a tree or two there, um, but as far as construction type equipment, you know, we may have to move a few things, bleachers and those types of things, depending on when part of the season we'd be doing any work, but, but we certainly could um, uh, make it possible to maneuver down there. That's fine. Additional questions for Mr. Campbell. Mr. Burgoyne. Um, isn't uh, 
the 30-foot drive sufficient, the 30-foot uh, piece sufficient for a uh, pickup truck and also for um, handicapped uh, people to be dropped off near home base and, you know, it doesn't it provide sufficient that? We believe, yes sir, access. we believe that's what staff believes. That's why we, we, we thought it should come a little bit further to the west. That's why the, the, the red line, um, but, um, but yes, to answer your question. Mr. Hart. Um, Thank you. This this may be a, a level of detail you haven't approached yet, but but it, a question arose in my mind: Is there planning for designated spots for bicycle parking uh, in in this in the parking lot or somewhere else in the park? Um, or that's we have not discussed that. I'm at, I certainly would ask right. uh, a Parks and Rec director if she'd like to respond to that. But certainly, I think there's there's room down there to do that. That, that's a great idea. Um, it hasn't been discussed, but but definitely that's that's one um, one thing to consider when we go go to develop that. Okay, thanks, mm -hmm. Mr. Rhodes. I was going to say when we ride our bikes down there, we just end up leaning them up against the post or something. So it would be nice to have a formal uh, bike place. But, um, <clears throat> mostly, what I wanted to do was to to thank all of those involved in in this dialogue over the last uh, couple of months to um, come up with a plan that maximizes the amount of land that's available for sale and therefore enhances the revenue coming into the city. Mr. Burgoyne, additional questions for Mr. Campbell? Um, just a comment. Okay. Um, I like the maps. I like the staff recommendation. Makes a lot of sense. There's. Um, I, I like the report from the attorney that shows that we definitely have the access. Uh, they kept an overlapping portion, so you could go from one to the other. It made a lot of sense. Um, this was clear. In, in part B, when we go to the next motion, um, the way it's stated now is per the recommendation from uh, the, the commission, but we should say we generally, generally support that as amended by, by this, that we just keep the 30 feet from as staff shows it. That, that's what I'd like in the next motion. It's not, it's not written there right. yet. If you'd like right. to offer uh, that amendment, that would, uh, that would be fine. Okay. Um, are there additional questions for Mr. Campbell? Mr. Gearbox. Just one. Um, I know the benefit that we're looking at is basically being able to use some of our TIFA funds or whatever to develop this parking lot and such. Just the way it's laid out and everything, is it sufficient for all the setbacks and everything to potentially, the way you have it with 64 foot wide, I'm just looking at the front, I just want to make sure that we don't give a, or sell a property that we were thinking of using for parking and then end up not being able to use the, park, the property that we're keeping for parking. So we're pretty certain that what you proposed here will fit in there within our current um, ordinances and setbacks and everything else? Uh, yes, sir. I, if you may recall this discussion came up, well, actually, about 2010-ish maybe, okay. um, about well, when, when count, the, the then council was considering purchasing the 207 Monroe Street and the possibility of putting um, the park, the, the new parking, I'll call it, on the south side of the daycare. And that was, I uh, believe, uh, 27 spaces that, that the then city uh, <coughs> city engineer, Rubel, and uh, um, DPW director Fordyce had, had worked out uh, as a pr proposed. So and this is 30 spaces, and so, I mean, this is obviously conceptual, but we do believe that, that there's ample, there is ample room um, um, to put a, uh, parking lot there with about 30 spaces. Okay, that's what I want to clarify because that's one of the reasons why I voted to buy the other property and now that we're kind of done a speculating type thing that which we shouldn't be doing as a council. Um, but at this approach I think we're keeping enough land that's going to help the park and eventually and now we can trade this over. So thanks. I just want to make sure that we're not giving something before we have put our eggs all in the basket. Additional questions for Mr. Campbell. No. Um, well, then I'll refer to our, our legal counsel, Mr. Smith. Do you want to uh, make a comment related to your memo dated July the 11th? I don't think I need to unless okay. there are questions. Okay. Are there any questions for legal counsel Smith? 
No? Okay. Um, is there any further discussion related to this first motion? No, then it's been properly moved by Burgoyne, seconded by Tahar to acknowledge receipt. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. The second motion is a motion to approve and adopt or not adopt the recommendations by the Parks Commission for People's Park as outlined in the memo from Parks and Recreation Director Scruggs. I'd like to move and adopt um, with the amendment of um, making the 30-foot strip as recommended by, town, by staff. Okay, so your motion will be to approve and adopt all the other subsequent language and then after Scruggs Right, um, except that the 30-foot strip kept by the city will be as shown by staff starting at 2000, uh, 205 feet from Monroe Street and extending to the east end of the property. Do you have that written out, Mr. Burgoyne? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll read it again. Okay, just for our clerk's benefit, and then we'll, we'll reread it for, for the council's uh, Okay. Okay. Um, to move, uh, to approve and adopt the recommendations of the Parks Commission for People's Park generally, I inserted the word generally, as outlined in the memo from Parks and Recreation Director Scruggs, Scruggs except that the 30-foot strip kept by the city will be as shown by staff starting at 205 feet from Monroe Street and extending to the east end of the property. <coughs> That's what staff recommended. Extending to the east end of the property is the last. Can you want to read that back then? Yeah, I'll read it. Okay. So Ms. Ms. Rutledge is going to read the uh, your um, amended motion back, Mr. Boyne, to make sure we have the, the verbiage correct. Okay. Okay, to approve and adopt the recommendations by the Parks Commission for People's Park generally, as outlined in the memo from Parks and Recreation Director Scruggs, except that the 30 foot strip kept by the city will be as shown by staff starting at 205 feet from Monroe Street, extending to the east end of the property. Correct. Okay. All right, so Mr. Burgoyne has uh, moved that amended motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Peters. Okay. Um, Ms. Scruggs, because this is the recommendation of, um, or at least we are uh, adopting uh, the majority of, uh, the, uh, of a recommendation from the Parks Commission, do you care to comment at all? No, I think that, that would work. Okay. Okay. Um, no? Okay. Is there any discussion related to this motion? No? Okay. Um, that's been properly moved uh, by Burgoyne, seconded by Peters, to approve the amended motion um, as verbalized by Mr. Burgoyne, then reread by um, Interim Clerk Rutledge. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. Moving on to the third motion, this will be a motion to authorize or not authorize city staff to proceed with a request for a proposal for considering a residential real estate broker to assist in the marketing and selling the uh, marketing and selling the property at 207 Monroe Street. Move to authorize. Okay, it's been moved by Mr. Har to authorize. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Roth. Discussion. Mr. Burgoyne. Um, we've already had an RFP for this and we have uh, a respondent that's ready to go, I would prefer that we just move, move it ahead. And I think the respondent uh, was Reinhardt. They're willing to do it at 6%. Um, I think they would do, they do this stuff. It's their bread and butter. They would do a good job. Um, I think we should, uh, instead of going through another bureaucratic process we've already done this let's just move forward I'll move that amendment to me to award it to Reinhardt do you want to offer that amendment Mr. Burgoyne I, yes I, I would I would like to um, authorize the uh, mayor and city clerk to um, be able to uh, sign a real a brokers agreement to real a standard 
real estate agreement um, with the approval of city attorney, of course, um, for one year to represent the approximately 3.61 acres, the, the resulting 3.61 acres. I, I think we can, brief, we can just yeah, we reduce that. I think all you need to do is say is, or I would make it, my, I've made the initial motion anyways, just to move to um, um, city staff to proceed with a um, broker agreement with Reinhardt for considering a residential real estate. Somehow just strike that out, that one portion where it says request for proposal for considering a real estate broker and to say city staff to proceed with a broker's agreement with Reinhardt Okay, so I, I second that. Mr. Campo? Um, would it be, um, could, we, could we reference the specific um, proposal that they submitted? Yes. In terms of the proposed? As proposed. Sure. Okay. So your amendment, Mr. Gearbaugh, would be to authorize city staff to proceed with a broker's agreement with Reinhardt Realty. Um, per their proposal. Per their proposal. Um, to assist in the marketing and selling of the property at 207 Monroe Street. Correct. Okay. I, se I second that. You second that as, a, as an amendment. Ms. Tahar, would you accept that as a friendly amendment? No, I would not. Okay. All right, so first we're going to need to um, discuss and then vote on the amendment. Okay? Um, Mr. Gearbaugh, do you care to speak to this issue since you're the mover of the amendment? Um, I believe that we've gone back and forth on enough... Um, with the different brokerage proposals and such that they did submit one and I think it's appropriate and they are providing a decent commission. So I think they're a local real estate agent they proposed at this point. I'd like to move this forward. We've been moving on it for six months. Okay. Mr. Burgoyne, do you care to comment at all as a seconder? I agree exactly with okay. what he said. Mr. Hart? Um, I disagree um, because the, the RFP that Reinhardt responded to was for a uh, commercial property. And so there may be a number of realtors in the area who, hand, who, are, uh, who handle residential properties who might have been interested in submitting a proposal for this property who didn't because the initial RFP was for commercial property. So that's my reason for um, not, not agreeing to the amendment. Is there any additional discussion? Mr. Burgoyne? Yeah, I, I just uh, don't see the reason for delay. Um, I think Reinhardt is, is a very capable firm in this area, and I think when they responded, they knew that there were residential and commercial portions. Um, Reinhardt has a commercial side, which, uh, of which other firms are maybe stronger on the commercial side, but Reinhardt is strong on the residential side. And it's, this makes sense. They've already responded to an RFP. I don't think we need to, to delay. Okay. Additional discussion? Okay. They were voting on an amendment to the um, third motion offered by Mr. Gearbaugh, seconded by Mr. Burgoyne, um, to uh, proceed with broker's agreement with uh, Reinhardt Realty per their proposal. Is that correct, Ms. Rutledge? Yes. Okay. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay? Nay. Nay. Okay. So that's um, four in favor of the amendment, two against. The motion passes. Um, so now we proceed with the um, final motion, um, which includes that amendment, and that was moved by Tahar and seconded by Roth. Is there a discussion? Mr. Gearbaugh. I just want to make sure when we're selling this that are we going to have a reverse uh, – an option to take it back or whatever because my concern is that how we ever sell this that we want it to be developed we don't want it just to be another piece of land that's just sitting there that's yes it'll be off the tax rolls but I'd rather see the investment and that was one of the reasons why we would be turning this back over is to see a bigger benefit for the city than just uh, um, sitting there so whatever happens I just would like to conclude in whatever arrangement we do that there's some type of um, requirement of some nature no different than what we do for our industrial parks or whatever. Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, I mean, as you, as Mr. Smith has alluded in other items, you know, we can put whatever requirements, you know, in any agreement um, the council wants to, and as long as the other side is agreeable, then then that could be certainly could be there. So, you know, I just want to be front, 
forward with this so the understanding is there is that we have those kinds of expectations so that we aren't at the last minute trying to negotiate something without having been forward about it. So. Well, if, there, if there's a consensus, if uh, I mean, I don't know if we want to get into that, if, if Council wants to get into that kind of detailed discussion or not, but but um, certainly if there's a consensus, we can, you know, we can put that out front and center and, and let the, you know, the listing agents know that that, that is uh, going to be a requirement. It, it might be more prudent rather than making a fixed requirement in that regard simply to let the agent know and, and so we list it on the card that the council will consider things other than price in determining whether to accept an offer such as a, a guarantee for uh, development and or impose a reverter. Okay. okay. I, I just want to make one comment uh, related to this motion. Um, first of which I was uh, somewhat indifferent to the um, amendment that uh, Mr. Gearball offered and that Mr. Burgoyne seconded. However, I did vote in favor because uh, I'm very much in favor of proceeding in getting something done. Um, it's abundantly clear to me that uh, no one can, can uh, uh, accuse this council of, of rushing this de decision or doing anything in haste as it relates to the 207 Monroe Street property. In fact, I think the proposal that um, we're voting on this evening um, is um, pleases me very much. Um, I, I suspect that this parcel will be uh, acquired, hopefully in the not too distant future, by somebody who wants to do um, some sort of residential development um, on the, uh, the site. Um, of course, transitioning this property from public ownership to private ownership will benefit the, the community um, by adding it to the tax rolls. Um, also part of, I think, one of our goals as a council is to, to um, utilize any vacant space that exists within the, the municipal boundaries of the city um, to, to see some sort of residential, commercial, or industrial development, because we understand it's in our long-term uh, best interest. I also think that in, in discussing and reviewing this proposal, I think there's also um, been a, a, a real profound benefit to, to People's Park um, in this um, proposed um, additional parking um, adjacent to the, the tennis courts um, I think will we'll, we'll benefit the users of, of, of one of our, our real, real unique and uh, one of our nicer parks uh, in the city. So I'm very much in favor of this motion and of course urge my colleagues to, to vote in favor of, of this proposal. Additional comments, Mr. Rhodes. Um, I also would like to support um, this proposal. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and while the site is not directly in our downtown, it is close enough to it that uh, individuals who would choose to live in this in this site once it's assuming it's developed residential which I'm sure it would be uh, can walk to downtown and so that will help our downtown location and I would also hope that whenever this eventually does come up to the Planning Commission that um, as dense a um, as dense of a development as can possibly fit in here without being out of place would, would be approved so that we can maximize the number of families who can live here. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Additional comments? No? Okay. That's been properly moved and seconded by Ms. Uh, Mr. Har and uh, Mr. Roth to authorize with the amendment that Mr. Gearbaugh offered and Mr. Burgoyne seconded that's already been approved. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say no. No. The ayes have it and the motion carries. We move on to new business, item 13-112. This is Celine Main Street Community Signs. This will be a motion to acknowledge receipt of the July 15, 2013 memo from Bob Rosenberger on behalf of Celine Main Street regarding replacing the Cool City sign with the Celine Main Street Community Signs and to authorize or not authorize Celine Main Street to replace the current Cool City signs with the Celine Main Street Community Signs. Moved to authorize. Been moved by Mr. Gearbaugh to authorize. Is there a second? Seconded second. by Mr. Burgoyne. Mr. Rosenberger, did you care to make any additional comments? No. Very good. Uh, any discussion? Just glad to see current signs replace old obsolete ones. So we don't need to add any more signs. So if one can replace the same, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. Mr. Burgoyne. Plus, I, of course, recognize the logo, the, the sign, and, and it's good to see it in our community. 
again, just to reiterate a point that Mr. Uh, Rosenberger made earlier, we are still a cool city. However, that program, which uh, was something that our former governor, Jennifer Granholm, believed in very much, is, uh, I think, as Mr. Rosenberger put it, appropriately defunct, to say the very least. Um, so they're not really timely or appropriate. And um, acknowledging the fact that we are a Main Street community with these signs, I think, is, um, is, a, is a good thing. And so there'll be a nice addition to our, our downtown. So thank you for, for being proactive and, and requesting this, uh, um, this change. Okay. If there's no further discussion, it's been properly moved and seconded to authorize. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries aye. unanimously. Moving on to new business item 13-114. This is DTE Franchise Agreement, Ordinance Number 749. The first motion will be a motion to acknowledge receipt of the July 10th, 2013 confidential memo from Attorney Smith and to acknowledge receipt and reading of ordinance number 749, DTE Electric Company Electric Utility Franchise. Is there a motion to acknowledge receipt? So moved. Moved by Mr. Gearbaugh. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Tahar. I'm sure. Okay. Mr. Campbell? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, very briefly, and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Smith. It's They've done the, the lion's share of the heavy lifting, uh, but this is uh, an item um, uh, that has, uh, I believe the original one was, a, or this last one was approximately 20 years, I believe, uh, for the franchise agreement between the city and DTE. And so it has come up for um, renewal and working with uh, Clark Hill, our, our city attorneys, um, we had proposed uh, a couple uh, different uh, additions language and they were going back and forth and as you read in, in uh, Mr. Smith's uh, um, memo um, the backs and forth and I know he's going to talk about that in more detail but uh, I think uh, I, I think we have come to a, a reasonable I hopefully proposal that, that we're bringing forward to City Council so um, <coughs> if somebody has any questions for me I would turn over to Mr. Smith. Any questions for Mr. Campbell? No? Mr. Smith? We had some extended uh, back and forth with DTE uh, regarding a number of provisions. Most of them we came to agreement on pretty quickly. DTE requested that the city include an, an indemnification provision that basically said that if um, any work that the city did damaged DTE equipment that we would indemnify, fully indemnify DTE for that. Well, that would have the effect of um, waiving governmental immunity and we thought that that was inappropriate particularly since there's no franchise fee or anything paid for this so we didn't understand why we would do that if uh, governmental immunity um, was ineffective in the particular circumstance DTE would be left to its remedies and our insurance carrier would handle it the other thing that uh, we have been insisting on in these franchise agreements with DTE consumers and others is that there be a provision included that if the um, franchisee, DTE in this case, pays a franchise fee to any Michigan community, we would get a similar franchise fee. DTE didn't want to go for that. And so we suggested then having a franchise of a very short duration so that if DTE subsequently agreed to pay a franchise fee to someone, we wouldn't have to go without a franchise fee that they're paying to another Michigan community for 15 or 30 years, whatever the length of the franchise might be. We suggested a one to three year agreement. DTE agreed to five, and that's what we put in. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Are there any questions for our legal counsel? Mr. Rhodes. Um, not necessarily advocating this, but what happens if we don't sign a franchise agreement with DTE? Do they quit providing electricity to the city? And its well, te technically, they're, uh, it's illegal for them to provide electricity without a franchise, so um, I'm not sure they would quit providing electricity, but um, they need this to make sure that they are dotting I's and crossing T's, and, and it's probably a condition of a lot of their financing and insurance and other kinds of things to make sure that they've got the um, legal authorization to sell power within the city limits. Okay, thank you. Mr. Gearbaugh. So with us resigning this franchise agreement, do we have any more leverage in de dealing with some of the issues that we've had lately with you know, power concerns where we maybe potentially had a 
uh, motherboard burnout at our water plant and some of the blips that we've had in the power. And there's been some concerns with some areas that are going out when there's storms, so there may need to be some more trimming of trees and such. Is this something um, within this agreement that we can hold them to? Well, we haven't got anything specifically in this agreement as to those issues. And of course, whenever you're looking at um, um, power, there are going to be some fluctuations in power that they can't control. As to the tree issue, we can address that. If, if you wanted to address it within an ordinance, we could do that. Um, you can address it either within the franchise ordinance itself, as we have in some communities, or um, with a separate ordinance regarding the trimming of trees by utility companies, which we've done in other communities. Okay. Because my concern is just that sometimes we've had some ongoing concerns and that usually with a franchise agreement we should be able to deal, address the, um, the service and what type of service we're getting. So um, I'm hopefully that we can look well, at that. And this, this agreement does have a short enough duration of only five years so that if the um, issues don't get addressed, you can certainly address it next time. Okay. Because we're experiencing them now, so I want to make sure they're getting addressed now. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Gearbaugh. Additional questions from council members? Mr. Campbell, do you make, care to make additional comment? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Just uh, in reference to Mr. Gearbaugh's concerns, um, staff, uh, consisting of myself, DPW Director Fordyce, and Wastewater and Water Superintendent Skull, uh, we met with um, DT folks this past week, uh, last week, and uh, to discuss those very issues of some of these uh, intermittent uh, power fluctuations or power blips and actually they, it was a pretty informative meeting and I um, um, didn't use the exact uh, the proper terminology that they call them but the, between the, the longer the five plus minute outages versus the less than five minutes and uh, so they recorded last year I believe they said two of the five minute five plus minute ones and um, that's still uh, within the good range, if you, you will, if five or more of those a year, then that's considered poor service. And then the less than five minutes, which are usually in duration of about 30 seconds to a minute, because uh, we have had some concerns. Uh, I've had a couple uh, calls from residents that we're trying to help address. And one of them is what they're calling an anomaly, and they're, they give data, of course, the new smart meters and such, and, and where essentially we're probably potentially a uh, maybe a uh, a branch falls on the wire, and the, and the the the, uh, the fuse opens, and then it'll try and close up to three times. To hopefully that limb falls off. Am I doing all right so far? <laughs> and so, um, um, so and if it after that third time, if it hasn't been able to, it hasn't fallen off, hasn't closed, then it would stay open, and they were, a crew would come out. Um, but apparently there's analysis that the, as they call it, the, the department downtown is how they re referenced it. Um, they analyze the data and there's, they're, they're, hope, they're trying to push to get that data so they can try because it's, they've had, we've had four of these uh, short intermittent, what I would call intermittent, uh, the minute or less ones. Um, it, we had four, it was end of, um, it was, I believe it was Memorial Day weekend into the into June a little bit the day we had four of those right at the, about the between 8:30 and 9 a.m. 8:30 a.m. and 9 a.m. in the morning and they're trying to figure out what through hopefully through this analysis that's part of it they also communicated to us they do have a detailed tree trimming program in and around um, Celine um, even though maybe we haven't seen a lot of their trucks I mean we see them parked of course and they, they do do help us with some bartering with, with service and whatnot and tree trimming um, but uh, they assure us that they are, there's extensive tree trimming uh, going on for the Saline area. And we also, for our concerns at our water treatment plant with some of these, they're going to be helping us uh, try and track down and hopefully we can improve on so we don't continue to lose the variable frequency drives and such. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Any additional questions related to uh, this first motion? No? Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. Then it's been properly moved by Gearboss, seconded by Tahar, to acknowledge receipt. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. Moving on to the subsequent motion, this will be a motion to approve and adopt or not adopt said ordinance number 749 as submitted.
Move to approve and adopt. Second. Move, move by Gearbach to approve and adopt and seconded by Councilman Peters. Discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor of approving and adopting the said ordinance number 749, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. Moving on to new business item 13-15, um, city clerk search. This will be a motion to acknowledge receipt of the July 10th, 2013 memo from city manager Campbell and to make a conditional offer of employment for the position of city clerk to Teresa Terry Royal. Condition upon satisfactory completion of a background investigation, physical and drug screen with a starting salary of $54,598. Is there a motion? Move to acknowledge receipt and to make a conditional offer. Okay, it's been moved by Ms. Tahar to acknowledge receipt and make a conditional offer. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Gearbaugh. Mr. Campbell, do you care to discuss your memo uh, of July the 10th? Sure, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I tell you, and certainly um, we have a few members from the, the selection team here, uh, including obviously uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Tahar. So I would invite any comments that if I miss anything or if somebody just wants to add something, but um, we were blessed. I thought we, we received 26. Well, let me back up. The council charged this team, the selection team, to bring a recommendation forward uh, to recommend the finalist to uh, um, as, the, as the new um, city clerk. And so we received 26 uh, applications, very strong candidate pool, um, very strong. And uh, we came up with uh, pool A and pool B and didn't have to, we don't believe we had to go down to pool B. Um, we interviewed six uh, very strong candidates. One of is our interim clerk, uh, Amy Rutledge, who, who as she and I have had a couple conversations. She did a fantastic job. Um, but again, we had some very strong candidates and um, uh, we, it was a two-part, it was an oral board for the first part of it, and then the second part were some written uh, to see some of the writing samples and how they, and also some procedural questions, how they would do certain things. And um, so, um, not to belabor this, uh, we, um, um, it was a unanimous on the selection team, um, Teresa Royal, her, she goes by Terry, who's currently the um, uh, clerk treasurer for the city of Chelsea, and We've received uh, many, uh, as we called, and, and check references, of course. This is, that would, of course, be preliminary to the, the in-depth background check that we would do for any uh, finalist um, for a conditional offer. Uh, but uh, very glowing. I know um, uh, Chief Rinnick uh, was at a, a, an event with uh, Chief uh, Toth from Chelsea, and he said, hey, you're, I tell you, you, you can't, you're going to be very, very happy. Uh, so, um, but it was, again, um, she, uh, with her experience, and we just believe she had that, you know, you're looking for the, in this, at this level, looking also for a solid fit within the organization, and we all believe that that was, that she's going to be a solid fit, and, and uh, we'd be very, very happy um, uh, with her. So, um, having said that, is it okay, Mayor, if, if any other mm -hmm. members, if they had anything they wanted to add to that? Mr. Hart. Yes. Yes. I would. I would also say I was. I was very impressed with the the uh, number of applications we received and um, the qualifications. Really, of almost all of the cap the the candidates or the applicants were were quite interesting. Um, and I also think that uh, the the process that we used was very important. Um, we had written uh, material to evaluate. We had the the in person interviews and then um, the the written boards the exercises the scenarios we gave them and um, all three of those were really critical I think in in coming to a final decision and um, Ms. Royal was was clearly um, the top choice when we looked at the at, at all of the aspects so I'm I'm very pleased um, that she was in the pool and I hope that she will accept the offer if we make it uh. Treasurer Bennett, Chief Rennick, DPW Director Fortis, I know you're all on the task force. Do you care to comment at all? No? Okay. Well, um, to the three of you and then to City Manager Campbell and Mayor Pro Tem Tahar, as well as um, City of Sturgis Clerk Treasurer Ken Rhodes, um, I think on behalf of myself, the Mayor, and uh, 
the rest of council and all the citizens of Saline, we thank you for your service and your willingness to participate um, as members of this hiring task force. It's, it's a very important service and we appreciate the, the time that you took out of your already busy schedules to, to participate in that endeavor. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, so this motion has been uh, moved by Tahar, seconded by Gearbaugh. Is there additional comments or questions? No? Okay. Then all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Ayes have it, and the motion carries. Moving on to discussion items, uh, commission and committee reports. Mr. Peters. I just say that the uh, 2013 Celtic Festival was quite successful this year. We had uh, great weather and a great turnout, uh, large crowd in town and down at the park. The Mast on Mayhem was a great success. People really enjoyed it, a lot of smiling faces. It was a great addition to the festival and hope with the symbiotic relationship we can keep that going. It was really, really a lot of fun. Uh, as usual, I heard a lot of comments from people, mostly from people, or a lot of people from out of the community on how, how beautiful Selene is and how well kept the homes and the yards are, how beautiful Mill Palm Park is, and several comment on how nice the people were. So it was a good day for Selene, and uh, thanks to all the hardworking volunteers to help make that happen. I just want to elaborate on that for just a moment. Uh, I appreciate you sharing uh, your perspective on the 18th Annual Celtic Festival, Mr. Peters, and I should first acknowledge that um, Council Member Peters is our Council liaison to the Executive Committee for uh, the Saline Celtic Festival and has served in that capacity for a number of years. Um, and it's um, certainly true to me, um, in the eyes of many, that the Saline Celtic Festival would not be what it is today without Mr. Peters' um, leadership. So thank you for that, sir. Thank you. Um, the, the second thing is, um, similar to Mr. Peters, I received a number of comments from uh, people at the park on both Friday and Saturday. It was an outstanding um, festival, I think one of the best. Um, the weather agreed with us, um, and the Celtic, Celtic Festival Committee continues to, uh, to add new amenities um, and new attractions to the event. I had a woman come up to me from Illinois who said uh, she wouldn't miss the event. She comes every year, and she thought it was the be best Celtic Festival so yeah, far. I had two people from Pennsylvania remark how beautiful Selena is, so it has Good. an impact. Yeah, so it, it, it truly is a, a special event, and um, um, we're, we're just glad that it was a success. So, thank you. Um, additional commission or committee reports. Ms. Tahar. Yes, thank you. Um, the Arts and Culture Committee has uh, issued a call for sculpture. Um, these will be for, uh, this is for sculptures to replace the ones on loan to us in the current sculpture walk. Um, we have a flyer. Um, there will be some available at the desk at City Hall, and if anyone knows sculptors who have outdoor appropriate works, especially those maybe all ready to go, um, please do let them know of, of this opportunity. Um, we have uh, a Facebook page, Celine Arts and Culture, where the, uh, the call for uh, sculpture, sculpture is posted and we've distributed flyers in the community as well. Thank you. Wonderful. If you um, have not already, you may want to share that information with Mr. Shonk. I don't believe he's still here, but he could yes. put it out on the city's yes. Facebook page as we're, well. We're working on that. Good. The other thing as it relates to the Arts and Culture Commission, I do believe you still have two vacancies. That's correct. Um, I did speak to um, an individual who has um, a background more in performing arts. She's a local attorney. I gave her an application, and I suspect she'll be turning it in in the, in the next few days. So we'll have the opportunity to appoint her um, at our first meeting in August on the 5th. That means you still have a vacancy. So for any of you who will be uh, any of you in the audience or any of those who will be listening or watching at home um, and you're interested in serving your community in this capacity I encourage you to go on the city's website or contact the clerk's office and get an application and submit it okay additional Commission committee reports mr. Gearbaugh uh, Planning Commission this past week met to discuss the expansion at bushes in the front their entrance and unanimously passed that that's going to be a new um, uh, approach they're going to move things around so that benefit maybe for their customers and such and I think it'll be a better approach for everyone. And the other thing, we talked with our planning um, company, and Doug Luan is going to be looking at the sign um, concerns that everyone had addressed here, and what they're basically going to do is have him cut, bring together a group of chamber and other individuals that want to consider and discuss what issues may be a concern, and not necessarily look at just rewriting the whole ordinance, but really finding out and looking at what issues are there and to see if maybe there's just something that we have to tweak or just re -under understand at a different approach. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Kirbaugh. Additional commissioner committee reports? No? How about reports or other announcements? Mr. Rhodes. I just wanted to uh, repeat something that Mr. Rosenberger had mentioned earlier, <clears throat> and that is this row downtown uh, meeting, which is taking place this Wednesday. 
starting at 6 o'clock at Stone Arch events in our downtown. This is very important that we get a broad representation of folks from the community who will come in and hopefully offer their comments and suggestions about what they would like to see Celine's downtown be in the future. Very important. So we hope to have standing room only. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Other reports and announcements. Mr. Uh, Roth. Saturday the 20th, the Sleen Area Historical Society will be doing a program commemorating the 150th anniversary of Henry Ford. We have a presentation of Henry Ford's involvement in the city of Saline. We also, the, there'll be cars there that be free, it's free admission. There will be a program where a person will be acting out the role of Henry Ford. Cool. So it's a good event, starts at 11, goes to 3, it's free, so let's hope everybody can enjoy themselves there. What's the date one more time? It is this Saturday, the 20th. <laughs> at Rentschler Farm? At Rentschler Farm. Okay, very good. Uh, any other announcements? Ms. Tahar. Yes, um, this year in October will be the 10th anniversary of the signing of our sister city uh, agreement with Lindenberg, Germany. And um, a, a small group of officials from Lindenberg will be traveling to Celine in October um, for uh, this, the, it, the, they will include the mayor um, and um, the, 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 uh, w the person in their sister city organization who is responsible for the relationship with Lindenberg plus the president of the, the Lindenberg's overall um, sister city um, committee. Um, so we are in the very beginning stages of planning a uh, celebration ceremony here at City Hall on Sunday. I believe the date is October 13. Um, and uh, it, you'll be hearing more about this later, but we certainly hope that City Council members will be present at that time as well as members of the public. Very Thank good. you. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Any other announcements? Okay, then we move on to preview or review, excuse me, of the presentation for our upcoming town halls on our city finances. Um, you should have all received in your packet a, um, a printed out version of our PowerPoint, um, which our city treasurer and um, finance director worked uh, diligently on. And then uh, Ms. Uh, Bennett and Ms. McDonough met with uh, city manager Campbell and I to review it. Some minor changes were made. Um, again, just to give you all a little bit of context, this PowerPoint it will, um, is meant to supplement information that will, has already been provided and information that will be provided at those two town halls on the 25th and 6th of August, which is that um, economic uh, forecast or economic history um, pamphlet that we approved at our last council meeting. So that information will be provided at those two town halls in addition to the information that will be expressed via PowerPoint. Um, just a little bit more history or context, uh, not history, but um, just want to make sure that everyone's aware of what, what's going to happen on each one of those town halls is um, there will be comment cards um, available. There will be that brochure available when people walk in. We'll encourage people to, to, to sign in. Um, I will give a brief... Um, share some brief opening remarks and then turn it over to Mr. Campbell who will share some sentiments and then it will be turned over to um, our Treasurer's Department, Ms. Bennett and Ms. McDonough to go over the um, trifold as well as the PowerPoint and then open it up to questions and comments at the end and maybe we hopefully we'll have a little bit more of a dialogue at that point. So um, Ms. Bennett, if you want to come up maybe and briefly comment and then if there are suggested changes or modifications that Council would like to see, um, you know, I'll entertain those and then see if we have a consensus on how best to move forward. So Ms. Bennett. Okay, so as Brian outlined, um, <clears throat> the, the pamphlet that we've worked so hard on and you guys approved does basically what we were trying to do there is to show the impact during the economic recession that um, everyone, so the, we kind of wanted just to get some bullet points and some really quick factual information. And so then at the town hall, we that town hall meeting after Brian does his introduction, what we wanted to show is um, more how we have changed as a city, you know, um, where we've went over the past couple years, how we've, how we've, what we did when the times were good, what we've done when things weren't so bad, and what our plans are for going forward. And understanding that during that time frame, we had 
<clears throat> new construction. We had um, all you know record highs. We had proposal tax proposal legislation changes with proposal A, and we've fared through all of that with you know pretty. I think we we fared very strong, and now that you know we're moving forward, the economy is picking back up. The city is taking these proactive steps, and we're going to start rebuilding, and to, so that we can prepare for what else happens what else what they what we get dealt with <laughs> so that's why this is a you know these this is kind of a little bit different but we're just briefly going to try to just show some pictures and just kind of talk about um, basically like I say the good the bad and the reality where we were where we've been and where we're going there quite let me start with are there any questions relating to the slides um, and once we get done with questions, then we'll get more into comments or suggested changes. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, do you have a question for uh, Treasurer Bennett? I do, thank you. Uh, on the slide titled Operating a City, there's uh, under demand of service, there's a number for new residents and commercial buildings. And also relating the next page, cutting the cost, the reduction of employees. And it's not clear to me what the time period is that's being addressed by those categories. Okay. <laughs> well, we were, um, it's through the whole, what I tried to do within this is to, to kind of keep it within the same time frame. So from 2003 through the current year, this whole slideshow was as a different time frame. Um, and then the costs that we've cut are the costs that we've cut as we outlined in the, um, on the brochure, the numbers of employees and stuff like that, because we didn't really start cutting employees until the, the, the 2000, when we started stop, or 2006, when we stopped replacing people and things like that. So, so the number of, say, new residents, 1,149, that, that is from 2002 to current? Um, that was the information. I just did a total of new construction from what the assessor was able to pull from me from her files, and that total actually is <clears throat> from year 1991 when Catherine was pulling, and I just did a real quick total on the number of residents. So it's from 91? Yes, it is. Yeah, that seems a little That's a big gap. misleading there. Well, I guess <laughs> what, what I was... What initiated my question? Well, what was, I was trying to show was that... Well, I thought it was 2002, but then I was, I was referencing my information. What I was trying to show was that we were at a building high time. You know, we, we've put on a lot of construction in the past, and I will, I will tweak that number to run in conjunction with the dates of 2002. Thank you yeah, for bringing what, that. What, what initiated my, my question was the page right above a general fund balance starts at 2000 through 2012. And so I, I wasn't sure of the time period that we were addressing with all these statistics, but we, it seems like we should be uniform. So, thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. That, I think that's a pretty easy fix, Ms. Yep. Bennett, if we can just hone those the, the, the figures that are um, enumerated on the operating a city page to, to sort of correlate with the yep. general fund balance page. That would be, I think that would be, that'd be good. Yeah, and, and I am using stuff that was already existing. The, 2000, sure. the fund balance page is out of the audit, so I was just using numbers that were there. So, but I will define the timeline. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Do you have additional questions, Mr. Rhodes? No, I don't. No? Thank you. Mr. Gearbaugh, did you have a question? No, I just agree with Mr. Oh, okay. Rhodes, just to show the timeline on the top and actually show the date so that we're specific so everyone understands what we're presenting. Okay. Very good point. Additional questions? Do you have a question for Mr. Be Ms. Bennett, Mr. Burgoyne? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, well, first, I really appreciate the long timeline. I have been asking uh, to have um, about a dozen years shown, and that's good. I would it be possible, though, for every page to have the same timeline? Like, if it's tax year 2002 through tax year 2013, which would be, you know, um, FY or, or tax year 2001, probably if you start in FY02 through FY14, could, could you use the same number of years on every page, and then when you add things up like operating a city, the number of new residents, or, or whatever, it would all correspond. Would that be possible? Sure, yes. 
Additional questions? Comments? Okay. Then we'll make those two changes then. Mm -hmm. um, I think we'll be good to go then. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you, Treasurer Bennett. And again, we encourage you, uh, everyone up at the day is here, if your schedules permit, to uh, attend on both the 25th and 6th. That goes for those of you in the audience and those of you who will be viewing this meeting um, at home. Um, and your comments and perspectives will, uh, will be greatly appreciated during the, the dialogue and Q&A portion of those town halls. Okay? Um, if there's nothing further on our two upcoming town halls, we'll move on to a personal property tax update from our legal counsel, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, essentially, as you're all aware, at the end of the last year, the legislature enacted personal property tax relief. That calls for a number of things. There's a small taxpayer exemption that starts phasing in in 2014 for uh, parcels that are under 40,000 in taxable value, under 80,000 in true cash value. Um, commercial and industrial parcels of that size will be tax exempt. Personal property tax abatements uh, for industrial personal property will be extended until the exemptions take effect. There's a phase in of complete industrial personal property tax exemptions for qualified manufacturing personal property so that's not warehousing and it's not other kinds of things unless it's related to a manufacturing operation. And that will start with personal property that was new after 2012 will become exempt in 2016. In 2016, there will also be a phase in of personal property that's 10 years old or older um, that will also become exempt. So by 2022, all personal prop industrial personal property that's eligible manufacturing personal property will be exempt from taxation. Local governments are to re receive replacement revenues from two sources. There's an essential services assessment that will be levied against industrial and commercial real property on which personal property is located that's exempt from the personal property tax for not the small parcel exemption, but the other two exemptions. And that will uh, be an assessment for essential services, which are defined as police, fire, ambulance, and jails. There's a set aside from use tax revenues that will cover a, a reimbursement of about 80% of non-essential service property, personal property taxes. The legislation did not fully address some issues. Um, there are technical corrections that have to be made for the proper implementation and timing. There are some definitional changes that are being made. There was a need to address false claims of exemption and what happens if somebody falsely claims an exemption and what kind of penalties get assessed. Uh, there are potentials for abuses of the small parcel exemption that are being addressed. The package didn't address tax increment financing at all, so that's being addressed in the cleanup legislation. And there were concerns expressed by the Michigan Association of Counties, the Michigan Township Association, and Michigan Municipal League uh, regarding some of the legal issues involved, and those are also being addressed. This necessitated follow-up legislation. The lieutenant governor assembled a team to do that. It started with a group of about 45 people, including representatives from business and representatives from local governments and uh, representatives from the House, the Senate, the Legislative Service Bureau, and Department of Treasury. Um, that group was too big to do actual drafting, so that was winnowed down to a drafting group of uh, about a dozen people. Um, there were three people outside of state government inv invited to participate in that. A lawyer from Ford Motor Company, the Dearborn City Assessor, and me. Um, it now also includes some additional personnel from the MTA, MAC, and MML. Um, the initial aim was to have a package of bills ready in April. That slipped to June, and we're now looking at September. Uh, the, the difficulty is that it's a very complex problem to address both getting the exemptions right 
and then getting the replacement revenues right. There will be a package of probably close to 20 bills because each of the statutes that allow for tax increment financing will have to be amended as part of the legislation. So it's, it's complicated. We're getting to the final issues. Um, I originally advised this community and others we represent not to adopt or approve new tax abatements until we saw how this legislation was going to play out. We don't know exactly how it's going to play out yet, but I'm fairly certain at this point that it will not affect industrial facilities tax abatements. So uh, if you want to go ahead and approve those, that's fine, barring some really unforeseen change in what's being proposed, um, there shouldn't be any adverse effects. Uh, tax abatements you approve now will continue to be in effect for real property for whatever duration you set. Tax abatements for personal property will continue to be in effect until 2016 when the new personal property tax exemption takes effect. Um, there's a separate question in your tax abatement agreements. Your tax abatement agreements contain a unique provision that says if personal property tax reform cuts personal property taxes by 50% or more, the council can decide to terminate the abatement. Um, quite frankly, the, the state frowns on that, on provisions like that because the state's making up the lost personal property tax, either through the use tax reimbursement or through the essential services assessment. So their, the, the state's view is really you're not out anything. Secondly, um, the taxpayer is still going to pay the essential services assessment, still going to be paying real property taxes, so, um, and you won't have lost only about um, probably 20% of your personal property tax revenue from that taxpayer. So it's not as if the city's going to suffer a 50% loss. So I guess my recommendation going forward is that you might not want to enforce that uh, provision. And if you adopt uh, new abatements with new agreements, you might want to remove that provision. Now, it, it, the, the only danger is that there's a vote in uh, August of 2014, and if the vote does not approve the property tax relief package, um, then it will go back to the legislature, and my guess is that the legislature in lame duck um, would at least consider uh, repealing personal property tax even without a replacement package. I don't know as though it would do that, but it came close um, in December to doing exactly that. Mr. Burgoyne. Um, why not leave our provision in? Doesn't hurt and could help us. Uh, that, just not act on it if we don't lose anything. That, that's up to you. I don't make the policy. I'm simply I, I'd want to leave the provision in that's fine as a safety backup uh, it's, it's that uh, issue specifically mr. Burgoyne is not one that I I'm passionate about one way or the other I do agree with the comments made by our legal counsel and what I add which would come from more of a, a, a political perspective is that there's also some symbolism involved and I think it would be send a terrible message to some leaders in our business community to offer an abatement and then pull it back. Um, I think that would be, quite frankly, in many, in many respects, devastating. So I think there's that added component that sort of compounds the situation um, that this body would need to be cognizant of. Although the um, industrial leaders have never balked at it before. They've al al always understood that if the city gets its legs cut out from under it, then, you know, they shouldn't just one-sided get. I, I, I certainly don't disagree. I think, however, there's a distinction between having verbiage in an agreement um, and having verbiage in an agreement that you have a history of executing. 
Um, and so I think there's some level of confidence currently because we, we have a, a long track record of, of not utilizing that clawback. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, but it, it, it's, not a, it's not a clawback. It's, it's um, not providing an abatement if the industries no longer pay personal property taxes. That's never happened before. Sure. No, and we've always had it in there. It's never been an issue. It's been a safety feature for the city, and the industries actually have understood that, and they've considered us, you know, pretty smart yeah. to put a safety we feature. Can, we can, of course, discuss it and, and have a dialogue about it in the future. Again, my issue is not so much with the inclusion of that verbiage in the agreements. It's just from a, um, a government-to-customer perspective. I think that would be devastating in many ways to execute that. Oh, but that's my opinion. Oh, to, to execute it. Yes, that was what, that's, that's my perspective on the issue. Yeah, I, I was not talking about executing it. I was talking about leaving the provision in new IFT agreements right. as a safety feature in, in case it was needed by the city. Right. No, Just I get as that. a safety feature. Yep, I get that. Okay. Are there any questions for uh, Mr. Smith related to his uh, update on the um, personal property tax um, <coughs> bill package that, that's forthcoming in the legislature? Mr. Gearbaugh. Yeah, just point of clarification. So you're saying they're setting aside just 80% of for funding our personal property tax at this point. Can we use that as a figure in an attempt to try and to basically go ahead and take a 20% adjustment on what we do for our future projections and such? Yeah. For, for essential services, you should be able to get back 100%. Right. For non-essential services, um, what's happened is that they're setting aside from the use tax a given pool of money every year that Treasury is um, run, has run figures on multiple times and is estimating will um, reimburse the loss at about 80% for non-essential services. So, um, you know, the Treasury will be running some more figures again as the legislation finishes up and but because there's some tweaking that's uh, occurring and um, the administration's looking at the sufficiency of those funds. So, yes, I've talked with um, Ms. Bennett and we're using 80% as a rough guess. Treasury also has a... Uh, spreadsheet um, that hasn't been updated with some of the proposed tweaks but as of the last year was fairly accurate and allowed for some good projections as well okay I'm just saying that we should be looking at already starting to adjust our projections for yeah, absolutely that. right and I think we've done that in this budget yeah and evidently to, to that point mr. Gearbaugh because what you're really addressing is is being uh, proactive as opposed to reactive. Um, if you look further down on your agenda, um, we have tentative work meetings scheduled for both um, August 5th and 19th. Uh, my assumption currently is that one of those two work sessions will take place, but not both. Uh, and the intent is to meet with the Special Projects Commission to discuss um, abatements in our future policy. Again, to play more of a proactive game as opposed to a reactive game, considering a lot of the information that our legal counsel has shared this evening. Mr. Roth, did you have an, a question for our legal counsel? Yes, I do. I was just wondering at what level does this essential service tax start for is size of company or property owner? Um, is it at the higher level or is it at no, a very it will be, basic It will level? be for any industrial real property that has on it, um, it, actually industrial or commercial real property potentially that has on it and industrial personal property that's exempt under the new personal property exemption or under the existing personal property exemption. So any business that has one of those exemptions applying to it beginning in 2016 could be specially assessed. But only over 80,000 market value. At under yeah. under 80,000 you don't get reimbursed, right? If, if the total amount of their personal property is less than 80000 in market value, that's correct. If the total amount of their personal property exceeds 80000 then um, yes. Additional questions? Well, I'm just thinking, in reality, it's not going to help us out too much because we have only have a few that's over 80000 
we have we have we have a lot. We have about thirty million. Yeah, yeah pro Significant probably portion. probably not, not a few. Probably oh, any yeah. industry, most every industry has probably got personal property over eighty thousand in value because any any industrial equipment. Even a few forklifts and so forth may push it to there. You don't need to invest in too much personal property to to, to no, get in a value in, a, in excess of eighty thousand. Understand that the small parcel exemption. The estimate is that um, it, it, it account it accounts for about seventy percent of the personal property tax parcels, but they pay about ten percent of the personal property taxes. So the idea is that this may clear out a number of taxpayers, but relatively small tax loss in comparison. Yeah. Mr. Burgoyne, you have an additional question? Yes. Um, wouldn't it be reasonable to continue to provide tax abatements through 2014 to wait to see how the vote goes and if reimbursement is coming and, and so forth, and just assume that, I, I would assume that the vote will probably succeed because most people will be backing it and, and promoting it. So, so this process probably will proceed the way you're describing. Yeah, I, at, at this point, I'm not seeing anything in the legislation that that trips that up. The only possibility would be if the um, vote wasn't approved in 2014. So I, I guess I'm recommending that to the extent you choose to grant abatements, grant abatements. And you, you can grant them for real property and it will be unaffected. And personal property, um, that, that's up to you. And again, Mr. Burgoyne, we'll be having a work meeting where we'll thoroughly discuss that, that issue. Yeah. Are there any additional questions for our legal counsel related to this this issue specifically? No. Okay. Then we move on to water bills slash meter readings. That was an issue that was brought up during the public comment period at our last meeting, um, and I believe most of us, if not all of us, had received a email from one or two um, residents also verbalizing um, or articulating, excuse me, some concerns. So um, I ask that this be added to a dis as a discussion item at uh, at this meeting, and we have our DPW director and city treasurer to to address it. So, please. Okay. Well, I'm going to start since the water bill is usually what gets the person's attention. Um, we have, as Mr. Fordyce provided you. But well, we have multiple different multiple ways of reading the meters, but we have about 400 meters out there that still have a reader, which is on the outside of the house. And when those get spider webs and um, dirt build up and all of that, they can start to slow and sometimes stop. In our department, when we see, we send the, the DPW out to do meters and then they come back in and we see a read that doesn't fall within um, the range of their normal consumption will send the DPW back out for what we call a reread. Typically in the past, uh, the city policy has been that in the September billing, we have um, an inside and an outside read, which meant that the, the readers would go knock on the door and try to get inside to make sure that the meter is actually running in conjunction with the meter. What we um, have, what has been brought to your attention is when that reader has stopped or slowed. If it's a zero, if it stops, it's pretty obvious. You know, you got a family of five living here and we've had two quarters with no consumption, there's a problem. And you, you know, you knock on that door and the DPW in the, between the water billing clerk and the Department of Public Works, we really do follow through on those people and we get that taken care of. What happens more often than not is it just starts to slow and you gradually see the consumption go down. In the event of 396 Berkshire, we had during that same time a family, a divorce, an empty house, a single person. So the, you know, the lower consumption really didn't warrant anything on the, on the water billing, the meter, the reader, the water billing clerk's um, radar to say that there was a problem at that um, at that house. The policy that I, I don't know how long has been in place is that when we do a final read, when someone comes in and does a final read, which does take time for us to prepare, you can't 
call in the day of a, a closing and say we need a final read because we have to send a Department of Public Works employee out there and we have to calculate a bill. So <clears throat> what can happen is, and Jeff has enforced, that they get an inside and an outside read. And when the two don't match, we build the difference. And we have um, since with this billing, because we, when this was brought to our attention of this high consumption, the city, myself, I was requested that the city should eat that, that we shouldn't bill that. And I said to the contrary, if we found out that we were over billing someone, we would issue a refund check. So, you know, the, it, it's owed to the city, the water was being used, the meter's working properly. And so we started, we set up a, tried to contact the person. Of course, when it's a final situation, that person is leaving the city. They're not living in that home anymore. So your recourses aren't as, you can't shut the surface off. It's not gonna impact them. So you, you have a, a more collection. So we contacted the person, we advised them what was going on. Mr. Um, the realtor <laughs> got involved and we set up a payment plan with the prior tenant and we worked out payments. Um, this city council has approved a policy that if there is faulty equipment for a homeowner and they bring in a receipt, we allow that them to enter a payment plan and during the time of that payment plan, late fees, you know, we give them the opportunity to pay for that faulty equipment over the course of the time without assessing them late fees. That's the same policy, under that policy is how I determined that we could do a payment plan in these situations. Um, with this past water billing, we sent out letters with the bills. The Department of Public Works set, drafted a letter and we sent it with the bills and we stuffed a card for everybody to do that have these meters <clears throat> to do an inside and an outside read. We've been getting those cards back. Um, it's not a real accurate science because somebody will read the Detroit Edison meter yeah, <laughs> and somebody will read the water meter and some of them are absolutely no help. Jeff and I look at them and said, this isn't any good, but at least it gets us a list of who needs to go back out and be visited. So the water billing process is that if when we determine these things, we will work with the owner to try to make it work you know, into their budget. The, my opinion would be that that owner would need to contact us as the city and ask what we can do. And that's how we try to, to pursue the issues that, you know, and the other one, the email that was sent directly to the city council, Mr. Campbell forwarded that to me, and that was the first, really, that I had heard that anything was going on there. So, I mean, we have a number of these reads, we have a number of um, reasons why people have high consumptions and stuff like that and we you know are billing 4,300 customers and so it would be nice if we could pull all those out and individually address them and you know but when the bill goes out if they contacted us directly and worked with us we'd be happy to put them on the plan going forward. Mr. Freud, do you care to comment at all? Yes. Please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think Basically, between Mickey Joe, uh, her department, and my department, we've instituted a number of new programs with with water meter reading, and um, catching these uh, these three you know discrepancies um, is the result of one of those programs. Where for final reads, um, we do require an actual visual inspection of the meter and and the plumbing, and get a direct read from that, not relying on one of our remote reading devices. Um, uh, the Park Place. Oh, sorry, not Park Place, but Berkshire, and uh, there was a, a smaller one on Detroit Street. Those are both results of that new program where final reads are done in the house. Um, the Park Place one that I, I believe was emailed to council, um, that uh, discrepancy was uh, first detected in 2009 as, as part of our standard program. Um, there was a notice delivered in the next billing cycle in 2010 and um, there was no response. There have been uh, multiple, you know, stop by door knock type requests for service and um, those had been unsuccessful. And then in 2013, f um, four separate notices were delivered. And finally on the fourth one, uh, the person responded. And by that time, the discrepancy had grown quite a bit. So, you know, we, 
the program that was in place in 2009 caught that discrepancy. Um, we've kind of have a standard when the inside meter and the outside reader are more than 5,000 gallons difference. That's when we'll go in and replace the meter. Uh, so that, again, that was detected in the final quarter of 2009, and uh, we were unable to gain access to it until uh, just this past month. So, um, and we have uh, ramped up what we call the postcard program. That's where we ask the residents to fill out a postcard, read the inside meter and the outside meter at, you know, very close time to each other, send that information back to us. Um, we've compiled some of that data that has come back so far. Um, we've gotten about 17% of the cards returned, and out of those 17, um, some of them, as, as Mickey Joe mentioned, are difficult to interpret. Um, <laughs> but of, of them all, I say there's, there's only about 11 that are just not usable, but we've only found one so far that has a, a, a verified um, tr you know, true difference that we're going to follow up on and we'll probably replace that meter. Uh, and extrapolating that rate to the, the, the whole volume of these meters, uh, we we're looking at five or six where there's a discrepancy more than 5,000 gallons. Thank you both. That was, uh, that was very thorough. Are there any questions for city staff? Mr. Gearbaugh. Is this a specific meter that we're having problems with? Or when you said 400 meters, I wasn't sure what you meant by that. Yeah, there's, um, we have uh, rough, basically three different kinds of water meters in the city right now. And the, the group that we, these are the oldest meters. Um, and they have, the, you know, water meter technology itself hasn't changed that much. You know, the internals that are actually spinning around and measuring the flow. Um, but how you read it has changed a little bit over time. So to avoid the hassle of having to get inside of, of all these houses, uh, this group of meters has a, a, it's kind of an electromechanical external reader so that we can just go up to the side of the house and see the numbers displayed there. But because it is a mechanical device, um, it is possible for, you know, one of the teeth of the gear to break off or like, you know, a bug or something to get in there and, is there a new, unique reason why we're using those meters in these situations versus all the other meters that we're using? It was state of the art at the time. At the time. Yeah. So now well, what? The meters are. But what do we, I mean, question, what do we do now and do we still send people out to read the meters, all of the meters? This group of meters, yes, you actually have to walk up and visually read it, so but it's on the outside of the house. Um, newer meters are read by radio, you just have to uh, drive by. So if we were to, like I had said about like the sidewalk, stepped up the replacement of these, we would save not only the cost of having individuals going out and reading the meters, we would s potentially solve this problem too. Well, then that replacement program has been going on. We replace um, about 100 a year. But if we were to replace 400 of them all at once? We'd be done. <laughs> Well, they, uh, you, you know, we have to obtain access into the house, uh -huh. and that's not an easy task. Even right. just sometimes trying to get a hold of the resident and advising them of a problem can be a task. But I know when we've reduced the level of staffing for you all and everything, you have to fit this in with everything else. So right. uh, it's and, like and, how and many more years it will take to right. four and more years to resolve that. Yeah, so. there's, a, there's a cost. There's a material cost. Right. And as, in addition to the time to gain access and make the appointment and, and you know, get in there and do the work. But being as an enterprise type arrangement, those costs are rechargeable and that's part of the whole process. So mm -hmm. this would be something that potentially would be offset by the savings on the staff having to go out and read the meters by putting new meters in place. And over time, that should be a very re <coughs> Over time, yes. I, my thing is I'm just looking at this thinking if this is a potential problem with just a simple single meter and we're seeing, you know, out of just a few that we've got another problem, it might be more beneficial for us in the city to really address this at what, once. I mean, in terms of percent, we're looking at uh, just slightly more than 1% that are right. showing problems. So I think that's that's pretty high accuracy rate. And you are replacing another 100 this year? This year? Yes. Okay. When does that take place, in the summer months, fall? Uh, we spread it out okay. throughout the year. And it, again, it's we, we, we focus first on the ones that we, we know have problems and then um, we're kind of trying to chunk it out in neighborhoods so that we can replace a whole you know a whole small district with the radio reads so basically at the rate we're going we'll have all of these old meters replaced in the next four years yes okay. mr. Burgoyne did you have a question um, I 
My question was similar to Mr. Gearbus, and I, I support his point of view, which is to accelerate. Because it, it is an enterprise that can absorb the cost if you can absorb some more workflow. Um, I, I would like to see it accelerated. Could you, Mr. Fordyce and or Ms. Bennett or both, could you um, uh, maybe in the future get us some sort of analysis on, on how we could go about supporting you, I guess it's more DPW than, than our Treasurer Finance Department, in uh, accelerating this process to replace these meters? Yeah, I'll, I'll look into that and see how many um I think we could possibly do. Because I think uh, on the one hand it rectifies these problems and then secondly it, it, it reduces a, um, not a necessarily a financial um, expenditure from your department but it reduces a, a sort of a labor intensive Yeah and task. that's really where I'm more right. looking at it from yeah. that perspective, the overall right. solution. No. Actually the, well, I should ask, that's the consensus I'm hearing from Mr. Burgoyne, Mr. Gearbon, myself, do other council members Support Mr. Fordyce looking at expediting or accelerating the process here. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think so. As long as he can fit it in with his capabilities. Right. Okay. Mr. Hart. Um. He, yes. I'd, I'd like to see cost-benefit analysis. I mean, if there's really only one percent of the meters that are experiencing serious problems, it's a balancing question, I guess, in terms of, of your personnel time. Mm -hmm. Mr. Peters? I support you. Okay. Well, I guess what we're really looking for, Jeff, is not, you know, um, not your commitment to do this, but just sort of a, an analysis on how it might be done right. and how we could support you in that endeavor if at a future date that was the consensus of council. Okay. Are there any other questions re uh, related to this issue for, uh, for city staff? No? Okay. Thank you both. That was very thorough. Appreciate it. Um, we move on now to the uh, fireworks ordinance. Of course, that was uh, adopted last month and there, at the request of a few council members. Um, we added this as a discussion item and, uh, of course, our, uh, our attorney, I believe, provided some information related to this issue. So I will, uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Smith and then if council members have any additional questions or comments, um, we'll entertain those at that time. Mr. Smith. Um, there were some questions, as I understand it, about uh, listing um, this ordinance on the table of fines. That would be a good idea. And in fact, there's also a revision of uh, many of our civil infractions uh, underway. As we took over the prosecution, um, my partner, Mark McInerney, um, observed that a number of ordinances could be updated and, and some of these fines updated and he is suggesting that, so we will fold that into the analysis. I also had occasion uh, before tonight's meeting to talk with Council Member Burgoyne, who suggested maybe we want to default, the default to be for civil infractions rather than misdemeanors, and we'll look into that at the same time. Okay, very good. Questions? Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, then our final discussion item was added by Council Member Burgoyne, and that's the former service center property. Mr. Burgoyne. Well, there's a, a strip of land in limbo there, and uh, it was not included with the service center property to be sold uh, with the thought that maybe Saline Electronics might need it for rail access in, in the future, but as it turns out, we did receive a map that shows that there's about twice that length. There's sufficient length that the property owner has along the rail themselves if they want access to rail, which they've never asked for, but they could have their own access to rail. So it seems as though if we have a kind of a stranded piece of city property and we forego whether it's 50000 or 90000 whatever the amount of money is that you get for it, it's an amount of money, it's tens of thousands. And it would be useful to whoever buys the property because a little bit more land, I think it's 1.4 acres, uh, I'll, some more acreage allows that developer to have a little more, more density. So it seems as though we should include it. Um, so that's why I'm bringing it up. Uh, when will we decide on that? I'm, I'm just bringing up the topic because it seems that staff needs to know 
what parcel they're talking about. And sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, staff's understanding at this current time is that they want the council's position, again, the majority of council is um, the approximately 8.24 acres, so as well as the 0.53 acres, which is a little piece of property on the very uh, southerly portion adjacent. Um, so everything south of the, the railroad and to maintain the portion, I believe, the portion of the property that, that Mr. Burgoyne is speaking of to maintain that in city ownership. That was city staff last understand, most recent understanding of the, the last detailed discussion that uh, this, this council has had on that property. Correct. Right. But, but, but at, that, at that meeting, we didn't have the maps. And the thought was, well, maybe leave it there. Maybe Solent Electronics might need it. But it turns out they have a whole stretch next to the rail. Yeah. So, Well, let, let's see about them getting some consensus on this. And, and if the, it's the consensus that we have a future discussion about that, I, I suppose that, that uh, that's fine, too. But my understanding of what the majority of council felt is identical to what Mr. Campbell just articulated. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm interested in whether council members agree with maintaining that approach or whether they want to, to deviate uh, at this occasion and uh, market some additional, um, an additional uh, component of that, that, that parcel um, in the sale of, uh, of the uh, former service center. Mr. Roth. When we had our meeting with a potential buyer, he indicated that he really didn't have any use for such. but. I don't know whether he considered that it would allow him to have an increased density for his building project. Therefore, since we were going to, in the past, hold even more land for future use that the city might have, if there would be a real connection, at least we'd have a little peace. Okay. So I don't believe, unless the prospective buyer can leverage having more acreage, we that anybody's going to pay any more for the remaining the parcel that they're looking at. Okay. So it's one of these things we need to work out at this at this point in time. I'm comfortable staying the way we are okay. with this potential buyer that he didn't indicate the interest. Okay. Mr. Gearbaugh? No change in opinion. Okay. Mr. Rhodes? Um, after receiving more information and thinking about it, I'm uh, I have a difficult time envisioning any use that the city would make of that long, very narrow parcel, and so I would be in favor of offering it to the developer. Okay. Ms. Tahar? Um, am I understanding correctly this is a piece that's north of the rail? Yes. And... Right yeah. Okay. And, and what we're selling is south of the rail, so it is not contiguous with the parcel that we're, that we're selling. Correct. So I don't see any reason to add it. Okay. Mr. Peters? I thought this little chunk of property was held in future use for rail service to the city. Uh, is that a legitimate cause or not? Not the whole piece. We, we have two other sites along the rail. We have um, across, across the rail from flat out flatbread mm -hmm. is a piece of city land with rail. Yeah. <clears throat> well, then I don't have any problem with offering that, that piece of property for sale. <laughs> okay, so um, we've got Mr. Roth who I, wants I, to. I can, I, well, I can change my opinion after hearing the rest of the discussion. Okay, so Mr. Roth would be in favor of marketing that parcel. Mr. Rhodes would be Mr. Peters and Mr. Burgoyne. Um, so it appears that a majority of council are in favor of offering that to a developer. Okay. We'll add it. Okay. Okay. If there's nothing further on that point, uh, we move on to public comments. Uh, under the Open Meetings Act, any citizen may come forward at this time and make comment or question to City Council. This public uh, comment period will be limited to three minutes per person. Anyone who would like to speak is requested but not required to state his or her name and address for the record. Are there any citizen comments? No. Is there any other business to come before the Selene City Council this evening? Just to reiterate, we will not be having work sessions on both of those dates, but we are holding them as tentatives mm -hmm. until we receive consensus from um, a majority of uh, the members of our Special Projects Commission. And again, the um, work meeting, whether it be on the 5th or the 19th, will be devoted to a discussion 
um, about the future of tax abatements and our tax abatement policy as a municipal unit of government. And we will have regular meetings beginning at 7.30 on both the 5th and the 19th. At this time, I need a motion to uh, convene into closed session to consider material exempt from discussion or disclosure by state or federal statute, in particular to discuss a confidential written legal opinion subject to the uh, attorney-client privilege. The City Council will not reconvene into regular session at the conclusion of the closed session. This um, requires a motion and then a roll call. Is there a mover? I move. Moved by Roth to convene into closed session. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Peters. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Rhodes? Aye. Councilmember Terhar? Yes. Councilmember Gearbach? No. Councilmember Peters? Yes. Councilmember Roth? Yes. Councilmember Burgoyne? Yes. Mayor Morrow? Yes. We are convened to close session at uh, 9.48 p.m.